Okay, okay, I know I'm a little obsessed. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs and the Idiot Quilter, and welcome to my weekly vlog for Monday, June the 26th, 2023. It's hard to believe that we're almost through the month of June. And we're getting right into summer now. Shortest day of the year. The summer solstice was just a few days ago on uh, June the 21st. So we are officially in summer. And of course, this past weekend was uh, the culmination of Pride Month. And in Toronto, there was the Pride Parade. Although looking around on YouTube, it looked like uh, lots of other major places in the world had Pride Parades as well. Um, so Toronto had a huge one. Over 1.8 million people uh, watching it. Yeah, we, minus two, Walter and I, we did not go to the Pride Parade. We haven't gone in years, mainly because it's a zoo. Way too many people. And if you were on Stephen and Walter Live yesterday, I showed you a picture that uh, Walter had, uh, had a friend send to him, and then he sent it to me, a uh, friend that was downtown in Toronto, Florida. I'll see if I can just find that picture for you. So it gets a little bit of a sense of what we're talking about for crowds. And here it is. If I can blow it up, there it is. So that's right downtown, the center of the downtown core of Toronto yesterday for a pride parade. These are the spectators getting ready for the parade. Look how deep it is. And that runs that crowd runs all the way down uh, for many city blocks uh, along young street which is the central main street of downtown toronto and it'll be lined like that the whole route it was hot yesterday too many people people with baby carriages we talked a little bit about that yesterday um you know trying to push little kids through that kind of crowd ludicrous ridiculous we didn't go and i am glad now uh, pride parades are for younger people anyways because really you get to a certain age you just want to sit in a bar and have a beer while the parade goes by <laughs> so to speak so yeah so that was yesterday okay so what have i been working on in the meantime well this is the african fabric table runner you know, I bought some African fabrics at the quilt show in Halifax, and uh, I bought this as a kit, and I put it all together, and it's really quite pretty. Um, the African fabrics are fine to work with, although there's a little bit more prep in terms of pre-washing and all that kind of stuff than for regular uh, quilt uh, cotton. Regular quilting cotton is what I'm trying to say. Um, but I really like it. Now, here's one problem, though, with the pattern. I don't know if the business that put this together just cheaped out because I couldn't see why they wouldn't have done this. If you notice, essentially, this is not a complicated pattern. There are four columns in the center, and that was it. That was all the pattern called for. That was all the fabric that was in the package for. Didn't say anything about borders. Now, maybe they just figured you'd put them on yourself uh, to get to the size you want. I don't know. But I did do that. I added those two borders, the lighter inner border, the darker outer border. And of course, they never come with uh, fabric for binding and for backing. That came out of my stash. Uh, so the only thing that isn't African fabric on this is what you see right now as the binding. And that matches the backing as well. That was something I had in my stash. Um, I didn't want to use any more of my African fabrics for the back of this. Um, and I found this one and I thought it kind of fit in with it because in itself, it looks a little African too. And it is just the backing of the table runner. So nobody really is going to see that anyways. But yeah, I, I like it. I think it turned out really nice. I quilted it uh, using a feather design. I did it on Lucy. Um, it's hard to see in this picture the quilting on it but I did use a fairly uh a color that blended in a little bit more with it because I didn't want to take away from the patterning in the fabrics themselves so yep now I do have another African fabric kit and uh it's for a small quilt 
Um, so I may dig that out later today and maybe at least get the fabrics in it washed and pressed, uh, ready to go. I'll have to see. Um, will I be buying more African fabric? Stay tuned to the idiot quilter tomorrow and I'll talk about that then. Okay. It'll be a little bit more of an appropriate discussion for the idiot quilter. And what else have I been working on? Well, it's in pieces, but it's coming along. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get it finished today or not. This is an in the hoop project with my embroidery machine. You've seen me do these kind of things before. This is a Halloween table runner and it was on sway on swale on sale. Um, at, uh, on, uh, designs by no, no, is this sweet pier designs by Juju. I think this is a sweet pea design. Hmm. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure right now. Anyways, one or the other. Uh, it was on sale 50% off. So I thought uh, it looks cute. It's fun for Halloween. So I have a few more pieces to get done on the embroidery machine. And then I can put it all together. And then it will look like a table runner and not like a big jigsaw puzzle. And what will I do it after with it afterwards? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about giving it to my sister. My sister gets into Halloween. Um, and she's a cross stitcher and she does Halloween cross stitching things. Um, I noticed that she posted a picture on her Facebook the other day showing a haul that she had ordered and had come in and it looked like some of the stuff was Halloween as well. So I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I'll give this to her. Um, because really, I think I have a couple of Halloween uh, table runners I've made in the past that I get out at Halloween too. So I don't know. We'll see when I get it done. Um, and I'm going to work on that later today as well. Okay, so that's what I've been up to. Um, you know, I also got a, a, a featherweight, uh, a friend and a subscriber gifted it to me when we were out east. And uh, it's sitting in a place of honor right now. You can't see it, but it's over where I used to have my coffee maker on the far corner. It's the first thing people are going to see when they come into my house. And if uh, I bring them down here to the sewing room or into, or into our rec room, um, I'm going to print up a little plaque for it and state, you know, what it is, when I got it, and who gave it to me to hang by it. So it's in a place of honor because my friend Colleen, um, well, she didn't need to give that to me. You've heard me say this many times before, but I was overwhelmed by the generosity of her gift. Okay. Let's move on then to the YouTube channel of the week and talking about the featherweight. Of course, once you have one, you're looking for resources and there are lots of resources for featherweights on YouTube. But one of the major ones is called the featherweight shop where you can buy things for your featherweight and where you can watch a whole series of videos. And I have been watching a few of them. Um, about how to maintain and use your featherweight. So I thought I review, would review that YouTube channel today. Just recently, I acquired a featherweight shop. It was actually a gift to me by a dear friend. And I have discovered that there is lots of videos about featherweights on YouTube. However, this one stands out as one of the premier um, or primary, I should say, uh, YouTube channels to check for if you want to know everything about a featherweight sewing machine. Now, usually I don't review YouTube channels that have anything to do with uh, quilting or sewing on my vlog. I usually wait for the Idiot Quilter episodes for that. But this one I want to share with you because I know many of you out there may be thinking about getting a featherweight. Well, you might want to check out some of these videos before you do. And if you already have a featherweight, you would like to check, you should check this out as well, because it's going to give you a lot of very inf interesting information about keeping your machine maintained, uh, cleaning it up, what kind of accessories you can get for it, how to thread it, all that kind of stuff. Now, yes, this is basically advertising as well for this particular uh, store. Uh, which is online. However, it's it's still a lot of very useful information. As you can see in their playlist, the way things are organized here, they have about restoring, sewing tips, um, attachments and accessories, getting to know your featherweight, maintenance tutorials, etc. Lots of useful information. So 
if you're investing in a featherweight machine, they are a vintage sewing machine, then you're going to want to check out the featherweight shop. You'll find the link for the Featherweight Shop YouTube channel in the show notes below. You'll find a link for uh, Sew with Stephanie and Stephen this coming Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And that may run until noon. That may run a whole day. It depends on what Stephanie and I have. Um, but the link for that is in the show notes below. Um, I put something new in. Um, I wanted to advertise some of my friends YouTube channels so I have put links uh, in the show notes for uh, Stephanie Stitches, uh, for Adam Sews, for Quilt Meeks World and for the guy who sews as well and if you've never checked out any of those channels and you're interested in quilting then you need to check those out. There is a link for uh, a an interview I did in the past week with a fascinating individual, uh, Rianne from the Netherlands. She is the owner of Kick-Ass Quilts. Love that name. Um, so check that out. She's got a really unique way, I think, at looking at uh, quilting and sustainability. Um, there's also a link for the latest Idiot Quilter episode, for the latest episode of So Chatty. And for, if you missed it, Stephen and Walter live. And we had quite a varied and lively discussion yesterday. Uh, wasn't where I was intending to go, but it never is with Stephen and Walter live. You never know what you're going to get when you tune in. I never know what I'm going to get. Okay, so that's taken me to uh, looking out my front window this morning. And uh, here's what the day is looking like. It's a little gray. There was rain uh this weekend uh, there was rain earlier this morning there was thunder as well and a little bit of lightning um it's a little wet out there right now the day does show according to the weather uh channel if i just look that up again because i have a short memory it says we've got an 80 percent chance of sh of rain with thunder and lightning high of 24. okay maybe tomorrow's nicer no, tomorrow's only 70% chance of rain. They don't seem to be showing any thunder or lightning. Uh, about the same high of 24. Wednesday, 30% chance of, of rain, high of 24. And then partially sunny until Saturday, Sunday, cloudy. And then it looks like the week after that's going to be really nice. So that'll be good. Now, one little problem is we don't want rain tomorrow and Wednesday and I'll come to why we don't want that uh, later but uh, let's turn our attention right now to what's pissing me off this week okay ongoing story and saga it's a broken record you know that we had new windows and front doors put into this house last October and we have a window that has to be custom built it's a transom window it's a half circle that's over top of our double front doors. Okay. That was done. That was installed. We were happy, really happy with the installation. When the weather started to get a little colder into November, we noticed that the transom window was fogging up. There was moisture between the layers of glass. Now, those windows are sealed at the factory. They're not supposed to do that. So we waited for a while and it would come and it would go. So we started taking pictures of it and Walter contacted the people who installed all of our windows that got our $18,000 uh, for this job in the whole bit. And they told us we should call the this company that does the windows part of everything indoors. Long story short, we've been given the royal runaround by this company we had to contact since January. Our first contact with them. Um, they've been uh, the latest that we have had from them. We they've been telling us, okay, yeah, they had to order the window because it's custom. That will take a while. Okay, we get it. Can install it until or uh, replace the other one and get this new one installed until the weather warms up. Got it. Get it. Come April, the weather was getting nice. We didn't hear from them while they reached out. And yeah, they said, yep, uh, it was on their books and everything. It had been ordered. As soon as it came in, they would be contacting us to do the installation. May came, nothing. June, we were out in the East Coast. We got a phone call from them then. 
uh, want to make arrangements for somebody to come out and measure our window. And we, Walter says, but you told us you already had it ordered. This sounds like it's not ordered. Well, yeah, the manufacturer of the glass, okay, there's a third company involved here now, uh, needs us to send them the measurements. Oh, okay, no, no, they never ordered it. They either completely forgot about it or thought we would go away. Well, that's not going to happen. We're not going away. We're not going anywhere. So Walter's been dicking back and forth with these people. And I'm, I've been getting uglier and uglier about the whole thing. Because as far as I was concerned, from day one when we had the problem, it should have completely been handled by the people that we did our business with, that got the people that got our money. They should not have been slopping it off onto us. So finally, I did call them up after the last you know, contact with this company that's getting the window. And uh, Walter wrote out uh, a whole thing, timeline for what had happened since January. He had it already recorded and everything. And he included some voicemail messages that we got from them that are almost impossible to understand because uh, these people are from India. And I'm sorry. And if that sounds rude and sounds racist, it's not. It's a fact. We all know it. So let's say it. Indian accent is extremely heavy. You have, And they talk extremely fast. You have no idea what they're saying. And they don't get it. They don't get it. I have told them many times when I've been talking to somebody on the phone, going, I am very sorry, but I really don't understand what you're saying. I don't understand your accent and you're talking way too fast. And they just do it anyways. Yeah, but that's a rant for another day. And I think I've had that rant several times already. Anyways, Walter called up the company that we were dealing with originally that got our money and everything. And he's starting to explain to them what the problem is. I said, give me the phone. Now, at this point, we're talking to, for lack of a better term, uh, a rep, uh, receptionist. She's probably a lot more than a receptionist. Okay. The office. Let's call her the office manager. Okay. I want to talk to one of the two owners. But she wasn't letting me get by that. I started to explain what everything was about. So she turned around and did woman explaining to me about how logistics work how, you know, the whole manufacturing process. And then she's comparing it to Sony and other companies. And I'm letting her go on and on. But I am, if she could have saw my face, she would know at that point, I was sharpening the points on my pitchfork. And I was coming to get her. But I kept my cool. And uh, finally, she said, well, they would, you know, look into it and everything like that. And, that. and I said, well, in the meantime, I want to talk to one of the two owners as well so she said she would pass that on to them and they did call Sophia actually she's the daughter of the owner it's family business um so Sophia very nice lady we have dealt with her before she was absolutely shocked that the window hadn't been ordered yet because she was under the assumption as well she says don't worry about it we will look after it we will get on them and I said well thank you very much because you have a much bigger club than we do because they probably get a lot of their stuff for installing new windows nap from this particular company so it's probably a huge contract with them so anyways where we stand right now is the window has not been replaced we think it's on order and i've asked sophie to keep us in the loop and to give us a call every time she gets more information or at least touch base every week so if i don't hear back from sophia by this coming friday i'll be giving her a call again and I've already told her that we have more windows in this house that we want to be replaced. I mean, that was only a few that we had done. We need to have them all eventually. And it's a big box. And I told her we're putting that on hold, at least with your company, until this situation gets resolved to our satisfaction. I'll put a little more pressure on them. Because after all, bottom line is, they got our money. This other company did not. We didn't deal with them directly at all. This was all through the main company that we made all the, the contract with. So that's where we stand right now. And what I'm really pissed off about is customer service. It's a pass the buck thing. Haven't you found that? You go in to complain about something or ask something. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, you'll need to contact. I, I love this. A lot of them throw it back on you. And I know the trick. Okay. I know the trick very well. 
because it was part of some training I did years ago as a teacher. Um, they basically told us when somebody comes up and asks you a question that you know they're just being lazy. I mean, it's more of a context for education. You know, a kid doesn't want to do the work. wants you to do it all for them. Um, you throw it back at them. And you say, okay, so how, how do you feel you want to resolve this? Um, how are you going to fix the problem? Okay, so this is a tactic I'm sure businesses use as well. Because basically, they just want you out of their face. And if you solve your own problem, yay, less work for them. They can move on to other things. And, you know, sometimes that is an appropriate strategy. I get that. But in this case, it is not. They should have taken ownership for looking after this, this project. They got our money. We paid them, okay, for the service. So anyways, they are doing something about it. However, uh, we should have been more forceful about that rate at the get-go, but we weren't. Well, when I say we weren't, that's the way I would have handled it. Walter handled it. Mm, Walter tends to be a little bit more patient about these things. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, so that'll get me riled up. But you know, it's just, they want our money, but they don't want to give us service. And everybody's got horror stories about this kind of thing, I am sure. So, yeah, you know, a business will get my repeat business if their customer service is excellent. Even if their prices might be slightly higher than the other guy, if they treat me well, then I'm going to be loyal to them. Um, If they're going to just take my money and run, then no, 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 no. And you know, businesses in this day and age want to be careful of that because everybody has Facebook. People have YouTube channels. It, it's social media can make or break a business. Yeah, it, it kind of harkens back to the old days of, you know, uh, references uh, by my mouth, okay? Uh, people, you know, telling friends about a business. Well, people also tell friends uh, you know, when they don't get good service and that makes people that may have never dealt with a company at all, stay away from them because it, you know, we can influence family and friends. And now with social media, you're influencing a whole lot more people than just a handful. So businesses really need to make sure their customer service is a one, a one customer service can uh, disguise or hide a lot of errors a company might make or a business might make. It really can. It go good will goes a long way. It really does. Okay, so that takes me to new products this week. Uh, I haven't bought anything. Yeah, well, nothing of any interest. Uh, more or less supplies. I mean, I bought some stabilizer for Monfill because I'm getting low, and I bought some more filament for my 3D printers. Now, um, one thing, though, that I did buy, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, was a new, um, I'm never sure what to call them, uh, hot bed plate or whatever. The thing that you're basically is what the filament is put on to build your um, 3D models. But before we talk about that, let's check in on the grow lights, shall we? Okay. I'm a little embarrassed to show you these pictures. Um, this one's not too bad, uh, it, but things are getting a little overgrown. We got to eat more salad quickly <laughs> and the basil too. So all of this needs to be cut back as with this one. Now the onions went weird. Um, I think Walter's going to take some of those out and transplant them to our pots outside because he's already started putting the pots together outside. So that those brown curly things there are, basically green onions they're dead at least the green part is the bulb part might be okay i don't know we'll have to see um meanwhile over with the green stuff yeah uh the lettuce has gone pretty much wild so need to cut that all back eat it plant more 
And of course, in the jungle, now the jungle has been weeded out a little bit because Walter's taken a few of the tomato plants and some of the pepper plants and transplanted them outside. But you can see here, uh, we still have some green and red peppers uh, now and yellow on the pepper plant. And there's a few tomatoes there. The tomatoes, we're not getting a lot on them. Uh, it may be because they really need to go outside as well. Um, so, you know, still experimenting. You know, I said to Walter, have you read the book I got you at Christmas time about all this? No. Maybe I better grab the book and start looking through it to see, you know, there may be some things we need to do to improve things. I mean, it's coming along. It's been fun doing this and we're going to continue. Um, I'm really impressed with our green peppers. They are a little bit on the small side. Um, but we have green peppers and red peppers and yellow peppers. So um, that's working out. Now, outdoors, Walter has just started on this. Uh, you can see the one pepper plant to the left of the screen. Um, it's looking a little better. When Walter first transplanted out there, it looked like it was going to die. Uh, it was a shock to its system. You know, it had grown up indoors its whole life, and suddenly we put it out in the in the back, uh, exposed to sun, rain, and weather, and, you know, and, of course, squirrels. Um, so, yeah, it didn't look like it was going to survive, but it is. Uh, the tomato plants are were transplanted out there. They're doing not too bad. The one over at the right side where you can see a couple of yellowy, orangey tomatoes on it, that one, not sure uh, if it's going to survive. But there's more things to plant out there. Walter went out yesterday and he got some more pots. Uh, he's planning to put in some spinach and uh, we'll put in some more tomatoes and a few other things uh, out there and get that going. And you've heard me say this before too, but I love it in about the oh, tail end of July. It gets all the pots with everything in them. And, you know, when we have things not laying all around all over the deck up there, um, it looks really nice. I mean, just not the fact that you can eat it. But it's all very green and bushy, and it looks really nice uh, when it's all done. And then the squirrels come and pilfer our, you know, <laughs> tomatoes. Yeah, well, squirrels are squirrels. Um, okay, uh, let me switch over here. Um, so that brings me to talking a little bit more about my 3D printing. Um, I told you I bought a new direct drive extruder for one of my other machines here. I had good luck with the first one I bought. So my plan is to eventually replace all the extruders uh, on all of the all the three printers and put in direct drive extruders. Well, I discovered something about direct drive extruders. I did not know. There's something called a Bowden tube. A Bowden tube is just a long, hollow plastic tube that the filament is fed through and it feeds it into the extruder. Now, on a regular machine that doesn't have a dual drive extruder, that piece of tubing is about so long and it can, as time goes by, it breaks down and you have to replace it. And so you can have some problems with jams and things like that with it. Now, with everything that I had been reading about direct drive extruders, it seemed to bypass the Bowden tube. You didn't have that. That's the reason it's direct drive. And the filament goes right into the stepper motor that pulls it through and right into the extruder and bang. So in theory, less problems. In theory. Well, the new uh, direct drive extruder that I bought and installed was working fine. And then I got a jam at some point. And it's kind of a bitch to unclog them because of the way they are designed. But I did figure it out. And now that I've done it a couple of times, not a big deal, just an annoyance. But I discovered that there, I thought there wouldn't be a Bowden tube. There is. There's a little piece about two and a half inches long that connects the stepper motor where the filament goes down in. There's a hole that goes in. Then there's this tube. And then there's the hot, um, What do they call it? Heating block that heats up and there's a nozzle at the end and the motor up here pushes the filament through and it melts and does its thing. But there's a little piece of Bowden tube that connects the stepper motor and the extruder. 
and guess where the problem was mm -hmm. right there of course the little piece of Bowden tube that Creality put in there is the cheap stuff so it breaks down much quicker I buy a little bit better stuff it costs a little bit more and that's what I use and that's what uh my extruders both extruders now have in them but what really got my goat was then that's not it is direct drive but it's not really direct drive it just means they shorten the distance between the stepper motor the original stepper motor and the hot end by putting those two pieces much closer together and connecting them with a little short piece of Bowden tube than a long piece of Bowden tube now with a shorter tube less can, should go wrong but then I got thinking okay these cost me about 50 bucks um there's one that's supposed to be the the best of them all called micro swift switch micro switch micro swiss micro swiss I don't know if it's made in Switzerland I think it's not I think that's just the name they're giving it to make it sound more exotic and like it's all metal kind of a thing and they were about 145 dollars on Amazon to buy one of these um so I got looking into one of those and what did I discover it's connected the two parts the stepper motor and the extruder are connected with a little piece of Bowden tube so why bother spending the money I mean yeah it's kind of all metal parts um but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to stop you from having a blockage as long as you've got that little piece of Bowden tube in there that's a little another piece of plastic um over time it will deteriorate because of heat you know it heats up cools down heats up cools down that makes things wear out so I'm not going to invest in one of those I'm going to stick right now to what I've got I'm not going to buy another uh, the third um direct drive extruder for the last printer it's working along here very nicely when it gets to the point where it's annoying me uh with blockage or something then I will but not until then because <laughs> I'm putting these suckers on not difficult but time consuming and everything's in awkward positions I swear anything that's made in China I don't know how they figure it out but they make everything so it's impossible you have to have the tiny little fingers to get into that and they never seem to use nuts and bolts and things that are really you know easy to get a hold of because they're standard sizes so yeah but like I, you've heard me say before if you're getting into 3d printing world be prepared it's not plug and play and you're going to have to do a lot of tinkering and if you love tinkering and playing around with things you're going to love 3d printing if you just want something out of the box you plug it in and it you know makes everything you've ever wanted it to make uh then you might want to hold back on buying a 3d printer okay all right so that takes me to blasts from the past in terms of trips and this is our first trip when we went to New Zealand and Australia and that was 2016 wow that was seven years ago how time flies when you're having fun anyways uh here's uh Sydney again and this is our the first look at Sydney uh when we got off the cruise ship so here we are we have finally made it to Sydney and the ship's just pulling into the harbor now and there's the opera house and just behind it the city So here's another shot a little later in the morning. We've just had breakfast and we're about to get off the, the ship and uh, get a hotel, get our taxi to our hotel, see if the room is ready. Probably not because right now it's only 7.30 in the morning. 
So from there, hopefully we can just leave our suitcases and then we'll start wandering around the city and doing some initial exploring. So we finally made it into Sydney. We just checked into our hotel, but our room's not ready yet, but it's because it's like 8.30 in the morning, quarter to nine in the morning. But this is our first area down here. This is the Pitt Street Mall. And as you can see, it's all been closed off the street, all the stores, it's a pedestrian area. And lots of different shops. Looks like there's a few high-end ones in here as well. This is also part of the Pitt Street Mall. The section here is very Victorian and look. Another section of this mall. Lots of places to eat. Lots of little shops and things around here. So it's called Circular Feeds. Ships. There's a ship right there. We came in on. And this is just so you sit down for us. And there's an area down here called the Rocks, which is the original settlement. And there's the Harbor Bridge, which we, in another two days, will be walking right over the top and across. Walter's already crapping in his pants about that. Another shot at the Opera House. So you'll get to see it from the low side and then eventually a couple of days time from the high side. And here's another shot of the Opera House from underneath the Upper Bridge. And I don't know how many shots of people So you look way up there and you can see a group of bridge walkers. That's what we're going to be doing. And here's a shot of how high up they are pulling out and down. It's a soft landing, it's just water. What we're walking on right now is called the Circular Key, and it's got a good view of the Opera House and the Harbor Bridge. And you can see part of Sydney down there, and the back end of the cruise ship we sailed in on, and some of the city this way. I'm doing sort of a 360 here. And there's the bridge shot down at the base of Circular Key City. And these are the water taxis and the ferries that you can get anywhere in Sydney on one of these. Transportation system, we'll probably be taking one later in the trip to go to the Taronga Zoo. So here we are right on the grounds of the Sydney Opera House. See a lot of people going up at Harbor Bridge over here. Right down the front steps leading up to the upper house. I stand corrected. This is the rear of the upper the steps here. This is the back end restaurant in there. Apparently on New Year's Eve we will be eating in the front foyer at the gala. So here's the view from 360 here. And there's the city, there's Walter, and back for a start.
another bar area on this end. Park. Makes me all the way around from the opera house up into this downtown section as well. But there's this walkway. It reminds me a little bit of Stanley from the back. So that takes me to events in the past week. Uh, we had a pop-up so day on Saturday. I think we almost broke the record. We may have broken the record. I think at the height of it, we had about 34 people. That's pretty good. So every time I run a pop-up so day, I think I get a couple more. In fact, I wasn't even expecting that many because it's we're into summer now. People are going away on trips and things. The weather's nice. Turned out Sunday, at least here, or Sunday, Saturday here, it was not that nice. It was rainy, drizzly kind of day. And from what I heard from other people um, in other parts of North America, they were suffering from the same bad weather. So those are always perfect days for sewing. And so we did. And it was lots of fun. And of course, as always, people got me inspired. And when I say inspired, they enabled me to buy things. I only bought one little thing. It didn't cost much. It was just an embroidery file. Um, but there were other temptations there. And I was holding back. Um, but yeah, if you've never been part of one of my pop-up so days, um, just watch for it when I announce the next one. Next one will be sometime mid-July, probably. I'm thinking in around July the 15th, but not sure about that yet. So don't hold me to that date. Um, I usually announce it. it used to be when I called it pop-up so day, it was because I never knew when I was going to have one. So you get about 24 hour notice. Now I kind of am planning a little further ahead. And uh, usually I give you about a week's notice of when it's coming up, if not more than that. In fact, you've just had notice now that I'm talking in around July the 15th uh, for that. All are welcome, and you don't need to be a sewer or a quilter to be on there. You can be on there for whatever you want to do, as long as it's legal. <laughs> so watch for the next announcement for that. And, of course, I have a mailing list. And if you want to be on the mailing list, just send a message to my email address in the show notes, and I'd be more than happy to um, add you to the list. Okay, so... um. I talked about the window situation. What else did we do in the past week? Nothing. But what's coming up? Well, uh, this coming Saturday here in Canada, it is July the 1st and it is Canada Day. And for those of you that might not be aware, and I mean Americans, I'm learning a lot over the years having a YouTube channel about what Americans know and what they don't know about Canada. Yeah, I'm surprised. We know more about the Americans than the Americans know about us. But anyways, Canada Day, for those of you not aware of it, is like the Americans' 4th of July. It is the official date of when we became a country, when we became Canada. So, in 1867. So, that's this coming Saturday, and Sean, the guy who sews, has asked me to be on his live show that he runs every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. If you've never checked it out, you should. Um, and uh, yeah, he's having me on as his special guest. And uh, because I was the only Canadian, he knows. <laughs> and he thought it would be great to have a Canadian on on July the 1st, which is great. Um, so I've been talking to Sean about what I'm going to do on there. And there's going to be a little mini trunk show featuring some of my Canadian themed quilts. And I have a few other little surprises and things uh, that Sean knows nothing about. So it should be quite fun. It should be entertaining uh, the whole bit. I love Sean. Um, I'm very happy to be able to call Sean a friend. And, you know, Sean and I have never met physically, but we know each other through the wonderful medium of the internet so and youtube um so it's great I'm, I'm very honored to be asked i've been on his show before always a good time always a good time um so yeah you might want to tune into that this saturday the guy who sews 
8 a.m. Eastern time. And if you can't get up that early for wherever, whatever time zone you're in, don't worry. It goes up as a rebroadcast too, so you can catch it then if you're interested. So that's coming up. Looking forward to that. Um, we have got something happening. Actually, it's Walters tomorrow. This is why I said earlier about the rain for Tuesday and Wednesday, because this could possibly delay what we have on order. We've got some guys coming, a company. They're building, Walter, a big badass shed in the backyard. Walter is so excited about this. He's won it one for years. This is not just any shed. This one is a custom built shed. And yeah, it costs some money. I like to call it the guest house because <laughs> it's 12 by 12 by 8 or 12 by 10. I think it's 12 by 8, but I'm not sure. Good size. Um, so Walter was out marking where it's going to go, and he's readjusted that marking a hundred thousand times. Um, so I'm gonna call it the he shed. It's his shed. Um, so who knows, he may start to live in it. Um, you know, he wants to clean out a lot of the crap that we have in our garage. Um, because you know, we don't really use the garage for cars. Well, my car's in the garage, but Walter's is not. Um and there's other junk in there, like the snowblower or uh, lawnmower. Well, not the lawnmower, but there's stuff that you don't reach for every day. And Walter wants to get it all out of there and into the shed. And that'll give us more room to probably fill the garage with more things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so he's all excited about this. And uh, they say that they, they put it up in one day, the structure. And then the next day, they uh, put all the uh, vinyl siding on it and everything like that. It is a little house. Yep. Has a little window and everything <laughs> on there. I don't know if he started to pick out his wallpaper for it or not. He's already looking at ways of hanging up things in there and stuff like that. He's enjoying this. He is. And this is his baby. So, yeah. So go for it. He hemmed and hawed about whether he should get one or not. I said, you know, the hell with it. Just get one. Just do it. And he did. So hopefully the rain won't cause a, a bump in the scheduling because I know they're really busy. Um, And, you know, if somehow, I don't know if this rain affects it and they can't put it up that day and that, they might not be able to reschedule us until who knows when. And, you know. Walter's excited. So that's coming up. And that's about it. Nothing else to tell you. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to talk you talk a lot more yeah, in the Idiot Quilter about various projects I'm working on. I might have that thing that's behind, no, this way, behind me, the Halloween Table Runner might be finished by then. Maybe we'll see how the day goes. Um, and yeah. And so chatty on Friday, what are we going to talk about? No idea. Make it up as I go along. And then, of course, Stephen and Walter live on Sunday afternoon. Hope you have a great week. Um, hope the weather is nice where you are and everything. And, you know, we don't get that, at least here where we live, we don't have that many months of summer like weather. So we want every day to be perfect. So I hope every day this week for you is perfect as well. And we'll talk to you later. Bye for now.